American pilot, call sign Bat 21 Bravo, is shot down behind North Vietnamese lines. Roger, I have you, I have you, Bat 21 Bravo. The lieutenant colonel in those days was worth about $900 to $1,000, dead or alive. Search and rescue units respond immediately, but timing couldn't be worse. Bat 21 has landed in the middle of a massive North Vietnamese ground attack. Nobody recognized that we have a battle of World War II proportions going on. Knowing how many of the enemy was there, we were going to lose people. More than three decades later, a group of American veterans returns to Vietnam for the first time to tell their story of one of the costliest rescue operations in U.S. history. The back end of the helicopter came off. Huge ball of flames. I knew that if he was going to be pulled out, I had to go get him. This may be a one-way trip, you know, we may not be coming back. By March of 1972, the U.S. has lost over 50,000 servicemen in its eight years of war in Vietnam. It's a war that is increasingly unpopular at home. The death of a single man in war is a human tragedy. That's why we want to end this war. Since his inauguration three years before, President Richard Nixon has pursued a policy of Vietnamization, a steady reduction in U.S. troop levels in Vietnam, with the goal of turning the war over to the South Vietnamese. The decision I have announced tonight to withdraw 150,000 more men over the next year is based entirely on the progress of our Vietnamization program. From 550,000, we were down to about 134,000, and we were all going home. We we're scheduled to be out of there by the 1st of July. With the war ostensibly in the hands of the South, the Americans still in country serve primarily as advisors to the Army of the Republic of Vietnam, or ARVIN. One such advisor is U.S. Marine Lieutenant Colonel Jerry Turley, now serving his second tour in Vietnam. They said within eight months we'll have this office closed down and all Americans will be out of country, which told me that we were out of the battlefield we were into the reconstruction, rebuilding of a nation. Air Force Major David Brookbank is a B-52 instructor pilot who receives an unexpected tour in Vietnam during the U.S. phase-out. I was actually sent to Phan Rang as an O-2 pilot, and because of my rank and experience, they decided I would be better off as an advisor. By the spring of 72 in the Quang Tri province, just south of the demilitarized zone, the situation on the ground seems relatively calm. It has been nearly two years since the North Vietnamese Army, or NVA, has attempted an organized offensive. The enemy has flexed his muscles a few times, but he has not tried to launch the kind of sustained countrywide offensive that most U.S. commanders agree he is still capable of mounting. As an Air Force liaison officer, Major Brookbank is responsible for coordinating airstrikes for the South Vietnamese 3rd Division. On the morning of March 30th, he climbs aboard an O-1 observation plane to view the situation on the front lines. Once airborne, he works closely with a forward air controller, or FAC. But I was gonna be putting in some artillery strikes and I'll see in how the coordination between a pilot and a FAC in the back seat were working and also pushing to see how far north they were going. I spotted uh, a, a large buildup of uh, what appeared to me to be artillery shells that was in the DMZ right south of the uh, Camelot River. I sure knew that something was going on more than they had experienced in a long time. We took a jeep, drove on into I-2, the combat base where the U.S. Army had their advisory headquarters. Went to lunch, came out of the mess hall, 
and all of a sudden, boom, 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 boom. So it was a massive artillery attack on us, and uh, we ran for cover. We ran for the bunker. And that's the first time I'd ever been under heavy artillery fire, and it probably had 200 rounds in our immediate vicinity within the first few minutes. Devastating. With a lack of recent activity near the DMZ, the South Vietnamese Army is ill-prepared for full-scale combat. To make matters worse, the forward units are in the process of a rotation when the first enemy artillery hits their positions. Two of those regiments were designated to change positions. We had one road for all of that to be accomplished on. Now, you're talking about 6,000 people, trucks, they all have their families with them, dogs, cats, buffalo, you name it. As they begin to move toward each other, that's when the artillery hit us. So it hit not only them, but it hit the bases. It hit everybody. They've, they targeted the road deliberately. That caused everybody to go into a panic on the road. An artillery round would come in, land in the middle of them. It would be like a void. They'd walk over the dead, push them over to the side. It was mass hysteria, the worst thing I've ever seen. In what will later be called the Easter Offensive, the North Vietnamese launched three mechanized divisions across the northern and western flanks of the Arvin forces. Despite the eyewitness evidence of the attacks, the combined US and South Vietnamese heads in Saigon are receiving conflicting reports. We had two combined channels, the American channel and the South Vietnamese channel. We immediately said we're under heavy artillery fire. The Vietnamese were caught by surprise, kind of an embarrassment. So they did not report, hoping they could kind of clean the mess up and make it a little bit better later. So we have our channel reporting, boom, 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 the world is falling apart. The Vietnamese, silent. People in the United States thought the war was over in uh, March of 1972. But for us, we encountered an attack that was greater than the Tet Offensive or the Trung 19 Offensive. Nobody for the first four days and four and a half days recognized that we had a battle of World War II proportions going on. The people just grabbed their gear. Officers grabbed their things. They grabbed their boom boxes. They grabbed everything they had and they jumped on the trucks, left their radio gear, left everything they had right where it was and just ran. We're afraid and I was the senior guy in the bunker and uh, I had to put on a good face. And I was just as afraid as everybody else. By the dawn of Easter Sunday, just two days into the attack, the North Vietnamese have captured 11 fire bases, and the NVA is battling for the most strategic fire base, Camp Carroll, in the heart of the Arvin defense ring. Carroll has the greatest concentration of troops and artillery in the Northern I Corps, and two American advisors. NVA Anti-Aircraft Artillery Regiment No. 230 is one of the invading units led by Colonel Chun Quuc Chun. It wasn't that they didn't expect us, but with our firepower and all the areas that we attacked and destroyed, we had one will, the will of being resolved to fight to victory. Colonel says to Lieutenant Colonel Camper, we're going to surrender. And to save face, you and I are going to kill ourselves. <laughs> Camp persists. That isn't the way we do things in the States. When Camp Carroll folded, that was a low point. That, that was a shocker to us. It was very devastating. When they gave it up, we knew that we were probably going to lose the whole battlefield. Just a matter of time. As Camp Carroll falls, the U.S. Air Force responds by sending B-52s to bomb the NVA. Each bomber flight is accompanied by two EB-66 planes used to divert surface-to-air missiles, or SAMs. 53-year-old Lieutenant Colonel I. Seal Gene Hambleton, call sign BAT-21 Bravo, is the navigator on one of the EB-66s. We were in the air for one reason, to keep the missiles off of the B-52 meaning that we wanted them to shoot at us because we could get away from them. We knew exactly how long it took that missile to go from ground zero to 30,000 feet, which is exactly 10 seconds. The only light we got was a flashing red launch light. As Soon as we got that, we started to count 1,000, one, two, three, four, five. One problem, 
The thing was already halfway up before we ever got the light. And as soon as we said five, that missile come right up our tail. Wayne, that was the uh, uh, aircraft commander, uh, as soon as we got hit, he gives me the signal to go. Well, I went. The last thing I saw of Wayne Boldy was him waving at me as I was going out the, uh, the hatch. He should have been there. He should have been right behind me. But he wasn't. He wasn't because the second missile hit the airplane right after I got out. I'm in my parachute, and I am floating directly above a little settlement. Hamilton's ejection sets off a series of agonizing events and the most extensive rescue operation for one man in U.S. history. Over three decades after the BAT-21 shootdown, retired Air Force officers Harold Icke and Darrell Whitcomb, along with Navy SEAL Lieutenant Tom Norris, returned to Vietnam to visit the exact locations of this historic rescue. BAT-21 Bravo, this is Bill 34, guard. Uh... You say you are north of a river? In 1972, then 28-year-old Captain Harold Icke is a forward air controller flying his O2 just a few kilometers from Hamilton's parachute. We started to pick up uh, broadcasts uh, from the pilot. We started uh, communicating uh, at first on guard channel with, with the uh, forward air controller that was in this area. Roger, I have you, I have you, back to one, bravo. Stationed in Thailand as part of the 23rd Tactical Air Support Squadron, Daryl Whitcomb monitors intelligence reports regarding the downed airmen. He broke out of the clouds at about 900 feet above the ground, and he landed, as best we can tell, just to the south of us out in this field out here in this rice paddy. I got out of there and then got up into the, uh, in the woodlands, the forest or whatever you want to call it and dug me a hole up there and hid. I seal Hambleton, Bat 21 Bravo, lands about one kilometer northeast of the Camlo Bridge in the midst of 30,000 swiftly advancing NVA troops. Villagers weren't nearly as active as I thought they would have been because a lieutenant colonel in those days was worth about uh, 900 to $1,000, dead or alive. Air Force Captain Fred Boli flies an A-1 Sandy in support of pilot rescue operations. And knowing, you know, what was going on from reports that we'd gotten back from Hanoi, we knew of the torture and everything, I think everybody was willing to redouble their efforts in order to get any downed pilot. Almost immediately, two Cobra gunships are ordered to escort a UH-1 Army helicopter call sign Blue Ghost 39 in its flight north for the quick snatch pickup. The trio of craft are largely unaware of the bee's nest of heavily mechanized North Vietnamese forces in the immediate area. About two kilometers south of here, they cross the Dong Ha River near the town of Dong Ha. As they approach this location, uh, all of those soldiers started shooting at them, or at least it seemed so, and the helicopters started taking uh, massive damage. Blue Ghost 39, the UH-1, he crashed about 50, kilometer, or 50 meters to the east of us over here in huge fireball. Three guys were killed. The fourth man, the North Vietnamese soldiers, were immediately upon him, took him prisoner, and moved him immediately up to Hanoi. So within 30 minutes of the shoot down of Bat-21 Bravo, just to the west of here, we've already had uh, three men killed, one man captured, and those of us who are left to carry on this battle realize that this is going to be one very tough rescue. In quick response, the rescue center in Saigon, citing standard operating procedures, enacts a 27-kilometer no-fire zone centered around Bat-21 Bravo's location to protect the search and rescue mission, or SAR. Facing three attacking divisions, Arvin ground forces find themselves essentially forbidden to defend themselves. We couldn't believe it. It was, it was unbelievable. And the 7th Air Force agreed we weren't allowed to fire an artillery round unless 7th Air Force approved. They were not aware of any of the battlefield situations that were going on. We have lost so many people. When somebody draws this circle and says no fire in this zone, they're not aware of the battle. Never in the annals of history has the opportunity ever been given to an enemy to advance free at will. The implied message was, we are going to get our man out, and we don't basically care about you. So you think I'm bitter? 
I'm bitter. One man? Look how many uh, Vietnamese have been killed and sacrificed because you're calling off all the forces just to support this one man. Before he even graduated from high school, Bill Harris had been drafted from the reserves into pilot training in 1943. Nearly 30 years later, Harris is in Vietnam as an Air Force lieutenant colonel with perspective on both sides of the issue. SAR forks are very parochial. That's their job. And they're looking at it that, from that point of view. But in this particular situation, it did paralyze some operations. My Vietnamese brigade commander, when I told him that we have to cease fire because we have one pilot down, Colonel Din looked at me and said, one man, one man, we're going to stop? I would have left him there. He was alive. And knowing how many people that we already had in that area, how many of the enemy was there, their tanks and so forth, there's no way we could have got him out. Search and rescue missions was the most extreme an important mission to any Air Force pilot. They would drop everything and go for a guy. At this late stage of the war, the search and rescue mission takes extreme priority to maintain morale of the U.S. flyers. The hero of the SAR is the HH-53 helicopter, known affectionately as the Jolly Green Giant. The Jolly Green Giants had a slogan, that, and it was that others might live, and that was their mission. So they were willing to uh, to go out and risk their lives in order to save down crewmen. A Jolly Green Giant couldn't walk into a, the bar at the Nang or anywhere else and ever pay for anything. They knew that you weren't going to spare anything uh, at all to uh, try to save their life. Lieutenant Colonel Harris is the commander of the 37th Aerospace Rescue and Recovery Squadron, equipped with 15 Jolly Greens. When I came into the squadron, uh, the morale was not as good as I thought it would be. And so I told that operations officer, you put my name on that schedule like anyone in the squadron. They knew I'd die for them. I wasn't going to ask them to do something that I wouldn't do. On day two of the rescue operation, Harris puts down his clipboard and flies a mission into the enemy hot survivor area. I am actually below treetop level, and lo and behold, it appeared that were thousands of rounds were coming right at that cockpit. It was a barrage of firepower. 37 millimeter looks like orange softballs come out. We were getting fire power from every direction. And we got out of there, and uh, that's the first time I realized what the situation was below the DMZ, that two divisions plus fully equipped we're there. People at Da Nang, at the, at the direct air support center, probably could have talked to somebody on the ground and say, what's the combat situation up there? But they didn't. That night, Captain Fred Boli flies another mission into the rescue zone. An accompanying OV-10, call sign Nail 38, goes in to soften enemy positions around Bat 21 Bravo. We'd just begun our briefing. When out of the cloud deck comes an, uh, an SA-2, it passes under my wingman's aircraft, impacts NAIL-38 in the right wing, and shears it off in a big ball of fire. We're watching the parachutes come down, and so we, we know exactly where NAIL-38 Alpha and uh, NAIL-38 Bravo will land. Captain Bill Henderson, NAIL-38 Alpha, and First Lieutenant Mark Clark, NAIL-38 Bravo, parachute into enemy territory. Henderson is quickly captured by NVA troops, but Clark is luckier and lands in a built-in hiding spot along the Camlo River. As the rescuers assess their options that night, Captain Harold Icke circles above the two downed airmen. On the night, the middle of the night of the third, uh, I was up here more or less to babysit uh, the survivors. The normal procedure was for the survivors uh, to turn off their radios unless they were in some kind of a da danger and then check in with us every hour or so. The only thing is they didn't want to, want to hear me. So generally about the only thing I'd say, uh, understand 
yes, no, Roger, negative. That was it. As night turns to morning on day three of the rescue operation, the downed U.S. airmen are feeling a higher enemy presence around them. By sundown on the third day, eight A-1 Sandy aircraft have been hit by enemy fire. The three-day tally for the mission is gruesome. Three Americans killed, three more down, including two POWs, and 13 aircraft severely damaged. Fear is nibbling at your gut. You're meeting far more uh, resistance than you ever have before. You know that uh, people are dying up there. You'd wake up, you'd be thinking about it. It's not a productive sort of thing, but that's the way the mind works. It wakes you up and says, you know, what can I do different? And uh, how can we make this thing work? And it was predictable that they were going to have losses simply because the the firepower and the, the target-rich area in which those troops were moving. We were going to lose people. I had recommended to Saigon that we not continue the, the uh, Jolly Green trying to rescue the survivor. But we went ahead as ordered with launching um, Peter Chapman. Air Force Captain Peter Chapman is near the end of his tour in Vietnam. In fact, he has orders to fly with the Presidential Air Unit at Andrews Air Force Base immediately upon his return. I met Chapman at Eglin Air Force Base, and we were pilot buddies. We uh, drove to and from the base together, had a lot of time to talk and become friends, close friends. Against Harris's advice, the clear skies of day five bring an order from rescue headquarters to commence another air rescue operation for both BAT-21 and NAIL-38. It was my turn. I was still on a three-day uh, alert. I insisted that I go. Chapman, he insisted. And um, he really volunteered. I want to go. It wasn't his turn. But um, I agreed to let him do it. Feeling guilty about a premature bailout on a prior rescue mission, Chapman wants to make do one last time before his rotation. He straps aboard Jolly Green 67 to pilot the mission. Four Sandys, myself and my wingman, Sandy 1 and Sandy 2. We would go directly to the survivor's area. Two others, five and six, would uh, escort Jolly Green 67 and 60 to an area just south of uh, Quang Tree. So we go in low, no more than 500 feet. As slow as we can get the airplane, still keep it in the air so that I can do S turns back and forth through that whole area and see if there's anybody there. I've now spent almost an hour and 15 minutes at low altitude and nobody shot at me. I realized it might be a trap, but all the other mitigating factors said that if we don't do it now, we're never going to have a chance to do it again. Sandy 2, you will lead Jolly Green 67 in to the initial holding point. And so Jolly Green continues on in. He gets to within about 100 meters of uh, Bat 21 Bravo, S is slowing to a hover. Bat 21 Bravo, Bat 21 Bravo. Pop your smoke, pop your smoke. And just at that time, Jolly Green 67 comes up on the radio and says, I'm hit. You get the ground fire, Jolly. They then told him that to turn around and abort the rescue. He did that and turned around, back down in this direction, heading back across the river. Jolly executes his 180 degree turn and it just seems like he's there forever. And it is forever. Uh, for all intents and purposes, because he's just so slow picking up speed. From my view, the back end of the helicopter came off. And right out in this area, just rolled into a huge ball of flames. Jolly's down, Jolly's down, Jolly's down. Somebody said, oh my god, Jolly's down. No survivors. You get a big lump in your throat, because you know that six really good and brave guys have just died. As I'm standing there hearing all this conversation, and then here when he got hit, and then when he crashed and burned, I was stunned. 
I was, I was sick at heart, you know. He was only about two minutes picking me up and getting me out of there. And he finally went up in a ball, in a ball of flames, and I thought that might have, uh, that might be it. Five days into what began as a mission to return a sole survivor, the Americans have instead lost nine lives. I got on the phone to Colonel Muirhead in 7th Air Force and told him I think this is it. I don't think uh, we should uh, pursue that course. And it made me think of our motto, uh, that others should live. And it came through my mind, there's a verse in the, in the, in the Bible that says, for a good man, possibly, someone might dare die for him. And by George, there were nine men that dared to die for this guy. Well, one of the reasons that I came on this trip was to be right here at the site of the crash that I witnessed because, because of the fact that I was never on the ground in this area of Vietnam. I only saw it from the air, and uh, I think it will bring a sense of closure to my own memory of the, of the event. By April 7, through five days of failed rescue missions, the commanders in the bunkers are questioning the value of the rescue operation, and now they have a new problem. An OV-10 is shot down while intercepting NVA supply trucks in the DMZ, killing Marine Lieutenant Larry Potts. But the pilot, Air Force Lieutenant Bruce Walker, call sign Covey 282 Alpha, becomes the third man down deep in enemy territory. It certainly entered, started to enter everybody's mind. Can we continue to attempt this rescue in this way? Did we ever think that we should give up? Uh, no, ab absolutely not. We started to talk about doing it in different ways. And then they flew me to Saigon, where I ended up briefing uh, General Marshall, who was in charge of air ops. So he wanted to know what my on-site recommendation was, whether we should make any additional attempts uh, using a helicopter. And I told him I didn't think that we should attempt to do that. They called me and said, hey, look, this is the way it's got to be. There will be no more airplanes used. We got going to come up with a new plan. I don't know whether I was worth it or not, but they apparently did. The Joint Personnel Recovery Center, under the direction of Marine Lieutenant Colonel Andy Anderson, is a unit dissolving much like many U.S. units at this late stage of the war. With the continuing NVA advance up near the DMZ, Anderson's unit takes charge of the revised rescue mission. The new plan involves three downed airmen, Bat 2-1 Bravo, down for six days, Nail 38 Bravo, down for five days, and Covey 282 Alpha, the new survivor in the area, who is farthest from the Camlo River. The operation is designed to have all three downed airmen travel to specific points along the river, where they are to rendezvous with a commando unit waiting to bring them out. To relay these individual missions, the Air Force will use secret codes to communicate the routes. That 2 one Bravo was a, an avid golfer, and that he would, he would know what we were talking about if we talked about directions and distances using those, uh, those uh, golf courses. He called me and told me that uh, uh, we were going to play 18 holes of golf, and I asked him, uh, the forward air controller, and I said, hey, uh, what are you snorting? You smoking anything? No, no, no. He didn't pick up on some of the uh, talk arounds that we were doing, so it took us a while, and of course, we're just circling over here, uh, talking away on the radio, thinking, this guy's got to get this. He says, OK, we're going to play number one at Tucson National. And they finally done a go why a golf ball? And actually, a golf hole is distance and direction. I played that number one hole a 1,000 times, southeast, 408 yards long. So I walked off what I thought 408 yards. I called him. He says, I finished hole number one. He says, you out in the open? I says, no. You got a good hiding place? I says, Roger, you broke the code. Let's go. Lieutenant Tom Norris, a US Navy SEAL, is the team leader of this new rescue mission, the only American scheduled to be hands-on with the survivors. The reason I was picked was not because you know, of anything special other than the fact that I was the only 
person that was still assigned to those teams that was had time left in country. I had a I had a plane um, set up to fly me to Da Nang, probably within two hours. I was briefed there by Lieutenant Colonel Anderson, who had done all the pre-planning for this mission. For Anderson, detailing the merits of this dangerous rescue to already skittish South Vietnamese units in the field is met with near disbelief. We said, you know, we're going after, you know, these three pilots, and, and you know, can we penetrate your spaces to do that and, and get assistance? And the guy kind of looked at us and went, three? You know, three Americans. You're going after three Americans. It's kind of like, I'm losing divisions and you're worried about three Americans. Although not guaranteeing their safety, Arvin commanders agreed to transport Anderson, Norris, and their new Vietnamese team to meet with their third division counterparts. When we arrived here, there was this cement bunker, an old, old French cement bunker. My team and Teddy Colonel Anderson uh, were located in this bunker. The first day we arrived, they didn't know why we were there or even who we were. Nguyen Van Kiet is one of five South Vietnamese sea commandos accompanying Norris on the first pickup attempt. We were excited, especially I was excited to be able to do this. We were trained for this type of mission. The only person we were going after the first night was, was Clark because Hamilton had not yet made it to the river. I didn't know what I was facing out there. I really had no idea how many troops I was facing. I prayed for him. Honest to God, that's, that's the most intense uh, area that I think I've ever seen. It was very dangerous. We were out there the whole night between Highway 9 and the river, and the North Vietnamese forces were all over the area. Concerned about the concentrated enemy forces, Anderson restricts Norris's team to a 500-meter radius from the bunker. It's an order that doesn't meet with Norris's approval. We have special units that are trained to do a job, which we're very good at, and let us do our job. Don't put restrictions on me because they're not going to work. Once the operational end of it started, it was my mission. In the early morning hours of April 11th, Norris's team strays past the 500-meter limit and recovers Lieutenant Mark Clark from the bank of the river. After seven and a half days of dodging the very active NVA forces, Clark is returned to the relative safety of the bunker. We brought him back to this location right here. Um, and he was immediately um, uh, taken under hand by Andy Anderson. I proceeded to get my people, getting their weapons cleaned and ready to go for the next day, get some food to eat and sit down and get some rest. After we put Mark Clark into the bunker, a rocket was fired into the area and a number of the uh, Vietnamese Rangers were also injured. Several South Vietnamese are killed in this latest attack. Many others near the bunker, including Lieutenant Colonel Anderson, are wounded and medevaced out. We had a very reduced force, and uh, they were probably happy because they could leave here. As far as, as they were concerned, we were just pulling up an American soldier. We weren't helping them defeat the, uh, the threat that they were facing. As the rescue team takes stock of its injuries, Hamilton's health is taking a turn for the worse. He has been exposed to the elements for nine days without food and clean water, and his weakened state is delaying his arrival to the meeting point. When I arrived back on the scene, uh, we were unsure of Bat 2-1's position, although we knew he had worked his way down to the river. I got across the river, and I called the forward air control and asked him, I says, OK, what do I do now? He says, well, turn left, keep your feet wet, and move. Well, in Air Force lingo, his feet wet, that means stay in the water. I was getting pretty weak at that time, and I'd uh, I'd move, move 30 minutes, rest 30 minutes, 30 minutes, 30 minutes. The night of the 11th, after our other people were taken out injured, myself, the other two Vietnamese, and Tom Norris went about 500 meters upriver from the bunker. We sat out there in a very tense situation, and uh, he called me and he says, uh, told me who he was, Leatherneck One, don't be surprised 
that anything you see coming down the river. I had no idea what he was talking about. He said, Roger, I'll keep my eyes open. There was only a couple spots on the map that would matched what he was telling us. So we made an attempt to locate him at that position. We waited all night long, and in the morning when he hadn't come out, we were really disappointed. We thought that he would never be able to get out. It's very frustrating. You know, you know here you think that uh, you've got a fairly decent idea of where he might be, and you're feeling that you know, this is going to be the last evening. You're going you're to pull him out. After reluctantly returning to the bunker empty-handed, Norris asks the South Vietnamese Sea Commandos about conducting a second overnight recovery attempt. Okay, it's worth a try. We got the. Uh, but two the of the three remaining Sea Commandos express more fear than interest. I think they got a little nervous about going through the number of enemy units that we were encountering. And so they decided they didn't want to go any further. Yeah, uh, đúng như vậy. Uh, the other two decided that they wouldn't go. And I told him, anywhere you'll go, I will go. The guy's just one solid soldier. Uh, I said, Kit, this may be a one-way trip. You know, we may not be coming back. And he, said, he just looked at me and said, OK. Now 10 full days since he landed in enemy territory, I seal Hamilton holds loosely onto his life as he fights delirium and hunger on the banks of the Cam Lo River. At the same time, the reduced force of Tom Norris and Nguyen Van Kitt head out for their second and possibly final chance to bring Hamilton home. We wanted to drop him some supplies. We knew that uh, he was getting weaker. One of the A1s came in and dropped that uh, kit, and he said, it's way too far from me. It's gone over me. They informed me that he'd been missing his, his periodic radio calls, and they didn't think he was going to make it. So I knew that if he was going to be pulled out, I had to go get him. He was a good 3,000 meters or better to get to. Understand also now that Colonel Anderson had been wounded. I was in control of that operation now. Once again, the two-man team, knowing they must go beyond the ordered 500-meter boundary, attempt a different tactic. Tom and I took a sampan from the bunker upstream. By morning, we came to a bridge across the river. Uh, there were three North Vietnamese soldiers uh, on the bridge. We had been under the impression that that bridge had, had been taken a hit, and it wasn't still workable. But believe me, it was workable. There was, there was troops and uh, equipment on the bridge. We turned around on the river and followed the right bank of the river downstream. And about 500 feet from the bridge, I saw Colonel Hamilton on the edge of the river. I heard somebody say, Colonel. I says, Roger. He says, White. I says, Red. He said, well, get your butt in here and let's get the heck out of here. Because of Hamilton's gravely weakened condition, Norris decides to risk a dawn return with his prize instead of waiting for the cover of nightfall. So we put him in a sandpan like this. We laid him in the, in the middle of the sandpan. I put uh, two life jackets on him, covered him uh, with, with like a bamboo and vegetation so that we had something in the boat that looks like we were transporting rather than a person, obviously. And uh, I called back for the forward air controllers and, and advised them that we had him. Traversing over 2,000 meters past their authorized radius makes the return trip longer and more complicated. He would go in and out of consciousness and, and sometimes ramble, which we tried to restrict because uh, we were still out in enemy territory. At one point, as a matter of fact, that was a, uh, a major concern when uh, we had been sighted by some North Vietnamese units. And he, all of a sudden, just started to talk. We heard someone calling from behind us, hey, stop, come here. We looked back over our shoulders and saw three North Vietnamese Army soldiers walking towards us. I was afraid that they would start to fire on us. And it was like a, sending chills up my spine at the time. They ran along the bank, but the trail that they were on did not follow the course of the river. So when they get off into the vegetation, they get all hung up and they couldn't stay with us. Having evaded the immediate threat doesn't make them home free. A few hundred meters downstream, the trio comes under heavy machine gun fire. 
He fired early, and the rounds shot up the stream, um, breaking the trees and, and tearing up the water. We were being shot at pretty good. And I got to looking around, and I asked Tom, I says, hey, Tom, what in the world have you gotten me into? And at that time, we were advised we had some fast movers up that could help us with uh, our situation. And I believe I was probably talking to you at that time. I rolled in and marked the position, and you said, that's it, go for it. And, Absolutely. Uh, and then they came in, and they just did a wonderful <laughs> job. We continued on downstream, but paddling very slowly. We now were within about 200 meters of the bunker and saw some of the soldiers from the bunker run down towards the edge of the stream to meet us. Finally, Norris and Kit reach the bunker and unload their valuable cargo. After 10 and a half days surviving on nothing but willpower and hope, Lieutenant Colonel Hamilton is safe. News crews are on site to record his return to friendly hands. He's very weak at this time. Uh, he's sick. He, he can hardly hardly move. Uh, he hasn't had anything to eat for nine, ten days now. And uh, his condition getting wor progressively worse. Now three or four swallows in water. I figure if I could get on the ground, and if I could last the first night, there was no way they were ever going to catch me. All I could think of is, hey, Colonel, you're home free. As soon as we get high enough where you can see the Bay of Tonkin, I thought, OK, guy, you're, you are home free now. I guess you don't want to go through that again very soon. I'd do it any time if I can bring back another pilot. For their valiant work, the two rescuers receive high honors. Nguyen Van Kit is awarded the Navy Cross, the only South Vietnamese soldier granted the American Navy's second highest award. And Lieutenant Tom Norris receives the Medal of Honor. What's one human life worth? Um, you know, it's worth what you got to put into to save it. Each and every one of the people that were killed were doing a job that they felt was, was necessary for them to do. And none of them died in vain. Um, uh, to me, they're the heroes. It's not really the value of one life. It's the principle that we as warriors or as, uh, as comrades will never leave our, our fellow soldiers behind the enemy lines. And we'll never do that. If we have anything we can do to stop it. A life is a precious thing. So I think that you expend every possible effort because of the value of human life. A tragedy. Somehow we all remember tragedies. It appeals to the American people that it says, we, we care enough to, to do our best to bring you out, to bring you back. We're going to save every man. We leave no one behind. The idealist way is everybody comes home. Sadly, that would not be the case. Days after Hamilton's rescue, all radio contact with the remaining pilot, Covey 282 Alpha, is lost. Later, it would be learned that First Lieutenant Bruce Walker had been captured and ultimately killed by the North Vietnamese. Today, it depends on who you talk to as to the exact cost of the Bat-21 rescue operation. Some say nine Americans, some say 11. But due to the no-fire zone and larger tactics, others will say thousands of lives were lost. Iseel Hamilton lived 32 peaceful years after his rescue passing away in September of 2004. The only message that I can send to any of them is, I'm sorry. There's nothing that I could have done or they could have done to prevent what happened. And sure, you better believe that I'm sorry that, that they didn't live. It's fortune's award. <laughs>